what's up, everybody? Today's episode is all about mentorship and the importance of being a mentor, also being a mentee. And we've brought in two people today that have shared a relationship like that for 40 years. Uh, Pete Sears is a silver medalist with Team USA in 1972. And boy, does he share some amazing stories today. Uh, and Bill Cahill, who's a coach, he was a mentee to Pete throughout his time playing in the game. Uh, and these two share a really special bond and, and we dive into it today deeply and it's it's a fantastic episode you're gonna love it uh just make sure too if you love these episodes if you love what we're doing please give us that five-star review on apple podcasts or spotify or wherever you listen it really does help us and also join our private facebook group our kids play hockey the conversation for these episodes typically uh, expands there after the episodes we also get a lot of questions it's a great community of like-minded people that uh, share love for the show share love for hockey share love for their kids so without further ado let's get you into the episode with pete sears and bill cahill hello hockey friends and families around the world and welcome to another edition of our kids play hockey i'm lee elias with mike benelli christy cashiano burns is on assignment tonight today we are talking about the power of mentorship and are joined by two guests who have shared a 40-year journey as friends in the game pete sears won the silver medal with the 1972 winter games in sapporo japan as a goaltender for team usa and Pete was raised in Lake Placid, New York, and attended Oswego State University, where he also played. Outside of hockey, Pete served with the Army and served in the Vietnam War. And he was also an experienced history teacher, having taught for 33 years at Oswego High School. And get this. Pete has been named to the New York State High School Hockey Hall of Fame, the Oswego State University Hall of Fame, the Oswego State University Athletic Hall of Fame, and this last one, bit of a curveball, pun intended, the Oswego City Fast Pitch Softball Hall of Fame. We are also joined today by Bill Cahill, who was recently featured in this month's USA Hockey Magazine through an article by our own Christy Cashiano Burns. Make sure you check that out, which discussed his mentee relationship with Pete, which started in the 1970s after the two were introduced to each other when Bill was just a young kid. So make sure you grab your magazine. I'm holding it up for those of you watching. It is in this month's USA Hockey Magazine for July. Uh, Bill is a proud husband, father, and teacher at Volney Elementary School in Central New York and an advocate of character education, and he has played and coached hockey for nearly 40 years. We are really looking forward to diving in with you, Pete and Bill. Welcome to Our Kids Play Hockey. Thanks for having us. Hi, glad to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have both of you today. I always love having... Uh, great stories. I love having Olympic medalists on the show, so we're going to have a good one today. Uh, Pete, I'm going to start with you. Coaches sometimes forget the impact you can have on players, but you never forgot that. How come? Well, uh, growing up in Lake Placid, uh, which was a small community, but a very close community, we had uh, some adults that were uh, I, I, I would call them just uh, great, not only great coaches, but great people. And they not only talked about the game, but they talked about, uh, you know, what kind of a person you should be and you should be representing your, your community when you go away and how you should act. So uh, I always carried that with me. Uh, when I went to college, I had some great coaches. Uh, when I was at the Olympic team, uh, again, it just it seemed to progress all the way up the line. Uh, the coaches were always uh, instrumental in, uh, I think, developing how I thought and how I wanted to carry myself and how I wanted to represent where I came from. So I was going to ask this question a little bit later, but you dove into it. One of the things that stuck out to me about you was that you've been around somewhat of an Olympic atmosphere your entire life. So again, born in Lake Placid, uh, a lot of people forget there were two Olympic games in Lake Placid in, in 1980. Uh, and won at the, the turn of the century, right? And you were surrounded by those teams. You were on an Olympic team. Today, the Olympics are looked at a little differently, right? It's either NHL players or recently it hasn't been. Uh, we have access to unlimited information. The NHL is really the primary place that people look. So I want to tap into your youth a little bit and talk to the parents and the coaches and the kids now about maybe some of the differences that you felt from growing up in that kind of area where you know the pride for your national team was a really big deal right we, we tend to not think about that unless it's every four years of the world junior championship now right it kind of comes and goes tell us about that yeah the people of lake placid have always i think been very proud uh of being able to uh have had the olympics there i think it was 1932 was the first one it was and, yeah uh, and uh, some of the facilities that I played in were there because of the Olympics in 1932. I graduated from high school in 1965, 
but we played in the what was called the old Olympic arena. We skated on Mirror Lake, which was outside. Uh, that's where we, we really developed a lot of our skills. Uh, we would go out on the lake. Uh, we would be playing. If, if I was 10 years old, I would be playing with 18-year-olds. We'd, we'd divide up into teams, and the older kids would kind of take care of the younger kids, and they would bring us along. But the, the tradition of the Olympics, uh, we used to hear about, you know, almost every day. And then we would see uh, all of the Olympic facilities that were there, whether it was the ski jump or the bob sled run or the skating rink uh, that was there. And there were pictures up, you know, in various areas. So it was always there. And as a kid, you would think about the Olympics, but I, I, you know, I don't think I ever really thought about being an Olympian until I, I actually got into college. And, and started saying, I wonder if I'm good enough to try out for an Olympic team. And uh, th as it worked out, uh, we may talk about it later, but as it worked out, uh, that did happen. But uh, I think as a kid, you, you know the Olympics were there, uh, but you know, as far as you yourself being an Olympian, uh, I don't know if I was too immature or what, but I, I never really thought about it until a little bit later on about actually playing in the Olympics. You know, Pete, I'll tell you, it's kind of a common story, believe it or not, that some of the athletes that we interview say, you know, I didn't really think about it till it really became a reality. And I'm always amazed how many people do think about it <laughs> in youth sports today, right? Uh, another thing we're going to get into later in the show is the 1960 Olympic team. So obviously, you know, Bill, Mike, and I all grew up with the 1980 Miracle Team. Everybody's very familiar with that. Uh, you know, the 1960 teams dubbed the Forgotten Miracle Team. And you know, I'm hoping they're going to make a, a movie about that one day because that obviously inspired a lot of American kids at the time, including yourself. But Bill, I want to turn to you for a minute. Uh, you know, this article that, that Christy wrote was actually a little bit outside the beaten path for her. Typically, she focuses on, you know, tips and tricks for parents. Uh, but this article really focused on mentorship. So what was it about Pete's coaching style? I almost said peaches, but we're going to say Pete, <laughs> that helped shape who you are today. Uh, well, my first, uh, I met Pete, I started playing hockey when I was seven. Our relationship started when he was my seventh grade social studies teacher in 1977, uh, teaching European history. Um, you know, people like Vasco da Gama and um, Henry Hudson and explorers like that. So he was coaching Bantam hockey at the time, and I just would have been coming into Pee Wee's, but that was, you know, everybody in minor hockey couldn't wait to get the opportunity to try out and hopefully play for this guy. And, and I was no different. You know, that was my goals. We called it road team back then. If you didn't make the road team, you played house league, um, you know, every weekend. So, um, yeah, my first introduction to Pete was uh, through academics, through being my social studies teacher, um, and just a real desire to make yourself uh, as good as a hockey player as you could. So hopefully you could play for this guy. So... I got to ask this question now. It's kind of for both of you. I loved history in school. It was one of my favorite subjects. All right. Um, and I know a lot of people that are bored by history. I guess I'm kind of bored when it comes to math. So this, this it's not for everybody at the end of the day. But can we discuss for the second for a second the hit the importance of history to culture, to upbringing, to perspective? Because you know one of the things I really lean on, guys, especially if I'm having a hard day is my, main, my mind anchors right to, you know, World War II, Vietnam, right? Just what, what young men had to go through prior to me so that I could get to sit here behind a microphone and talk hockey all day, right? So tell me about the importance of history. Uh, I don't know if you want it for me first or what, but okay. uh, when, when I was teaching, I always would ask the students, you know, what is history? And, uh, you know, they would come up with various answers but but what i was always come back with is history teaches us how things got to be the way they are right now and you, you kind of go back in through all the various eras of history and say you know why did this happen well, you know why did this happen and so on and some people will say well you, you talk about history so you don't make the same mistakes over again well that's true to a certain point but uh, as you look around the world, it seems like we do make the same mistakes over and over again. But uh, I just like to think of history as, uh, you know, here we are at a certain time in a certain place. How did things get to be, be the way they are right now? Bill, I'd love your thoughts too. Yeah. 
Well, I'm glad to I'm glad to hear it's a three hour show, Mike. So I'll get started. <laughs> um, sorry, Lee, sorry, apologies. Um, you know, my heart. Uh, I currently teach social studies, um, and unfortunately, um, at least here in New York State, um, social studies and science has been pushed to the back burner at the expense of somehow ELA and math are mm. deemed more important. Um, to our students. So uh, they get ELA and math every day uh, for multiple hours. And in some places, social studies uh, one day a week. Mm. So it's tough to teach these lessons that we're talking about when you don't have the time in the classroom to, uh, to teach them. And I think Pete's right. I don't think we learn the lessons of history very well. Um, my heart breaks for Holocaust survivors and our World War II veterans who can turn on the nightly news and see swastikas flying in the United States of America. So that's a slippery slope conversation as far as the First Amendment goes, um, but I certainly hate to see it. And I can't imagine how those people um, that lived through that and sacrificed uh, 80 years ago uh, feel when they see that today. Well, I'll tell you both, there's nothing slippery about uh, what you just said, right? I think we all agree. I know I do wholeheartedly. Um, so thank you for your answers on that. Cause I think, I think it is important as well. And, you know, history is not limited obviously to just school, right. Just turning this back to hockey. I think a lot of people think USA hockey history started in 1980. <laughs> and the truth is that that is not true, right? USA hockey has a pretty darn amazing history. When you look at it, uh, Pete, I want to talk about 1972. I mean, a silver medalist approached in Japan of all places, um, at a time where, where the sport is not anywhere near what it is in the, in the uh, United States today, walk us through your Olympic experience. Cause I, I cannot wait to hear it. Okay. My Olympic experience goes back to 1968. I was going to school at Oswego state. I was, uh, that was the end of my sophomore year. There were tryouts for the Olympic team in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, back then the, the whole way of making the Olympic team was totally different. Uh, anybody could try out if, if, if they wanted to. You could walk in off the street and go into the rink where you're trying out and, and get out there and the coaches would take a look at you and uh, either send you on your way or keep you there for another day. Uh, so I, I went down to, uh, I think it was Framingham, Mass, uh, unannounced, and uh, they had a whole, uh, a uh, list of names. I had written my name to, uh, that I was coming down and apparently they had my name on the list. And I was glad they did. Uh, you know, we had practices, we had scrimmages, they put us through our paces. And uh, at the end of that, the Olympic coach, whose name was Murray Williamson, uh, he called me over and he said, Pete, he said, uh, we, I'm going to tell you the truth. We already had our team picked even before we had this tryout. But he says, I like what I saw on you. Would you be interested in playing in a developmental league, which is out in Green Bay, Wisconsin? And I said, who? Oh, the Olympic coach is showing an interest in me. I, I just said, absolutely, you know, without even thinking. And you have to remember now, the Vietnam War was going on at this time. I had an exemption in school. As long as I stayed in school, I wouldn't be drafted. But as it worked out, I did go out to Green Bay in September and uh, started playing in the league out there. And uh, there were some great players in that league. There were former Olympians in that league. There were some Olympians that uh, had played on the 1960 team mm. that were playing in that league. And I didn't really know the history of everything. I didn't know who these guys were until I got out there and uh, we started talking and I learned you know, where they had been and so on. Uh, but, uh, in December, I got my notice that I was drafted. Mm. So I, I was in the army. I went to Vietnam. I came back. I went to school and I finished up my junior and senior year at Oswego State. And uh, the timing of that was actually pretty good uh, because it was 1971 when I graduated from uh, school and 72 was the next Olympics. Same coach was going to be coaching. I wrote a letter to him saying uh, to Coach Williamson, I said, uh, you know, after you sent me out to Green Bay, I was drafted, I was in the army, I went back to school. I would like to try out again. 
1972. He says, well, Pete, he says, I haven't seen you play. The only way that you would have a chance to actually try out for my team is if I saw you play again. So he said, would you be able to come out and play in a summer hockey league in Minneapolis that summer of 1971? And uh, as it was, I was married then. Uh, I got married my senior year. I had a very young daughter. And uh, I told my wife what the coach had said. And she said, absolutely, let's do it. That's awesome. And she was always my biggest fan, my biggest supporter. So we traveled all the way out to Minneapolis in the little Volkswagen bug. <laughs> had my, all my hockey equipment, everything. And uh, didn't have a really, we didn't have more than, I don't think, $100 to our name. And we went out there. I got a, got a job working in a factory. Uh, we had a, we uh, met some people who let us live in their house for a few weeks until we could find a place to live. And I played in a summer hockey league out there three or four nights a week. All Division I players. Here I am from a Division Three team, Oswego State. Now I'm playing against Division I players. And I found out that I could play with those guys. And that's really where I got my confidence uh, to, to keep going at uh, this dream of, of, of trying to be on the Olympic hockey team. And uh, once, once that summer was over, uh, I hope I'm not dragging this out too long for you. No, well, I'm, I'm enthralled. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> once, once the summer was over and that summer hockey league was over, uh, I was hoping to hear from the Olympic coach, but I didn't. Didn't hear a thing. In the meantime, I get a letter from the Buffalo Sabres saying, we would like you to come to camp with us. That was in St. Catharines, Ontario. So I, uh, my wife and I uh, said, well, let's give it a shot. And she supported me. She went back to Lake Placid. I went to St. Catharines. While I was in St. Catharines, uh, I got a call from the Olympic coach. <laughs> He found out that I was there. He says, what are you doing there? I thought you were going to try out with us. I said, well, I didn't hear anything from you. So I, I just assumed you weren't interested. So I got a call from uh, from the Sabres, and that's why I'm here in St. Catharines. He said, well, you still want to try out with us? <laughs> I said, absolutely. So I had to go to the coach of the Buffalo Sabres. His name, you probably heard the name, Punch Imlac. Yep. That's the old-time name. Okay, <laughs> big name. And I said, here's, here's what happened, coach. And I said, I have a chance to try out for the U.S. Olympic team. And I, I, and I know I'm here. I want to be here. But I also want to try out for the Olympic team. He said, if I were you, I would never pass that up, up that opportunity. Hmm. So I hop in the Volkswagen all by myself this time. I drive out to, back out to Minneapolis from St. Catharines. I never went back home to Lake Placid. And we started tryouts out there. And again... Uh, this was a lot of the guys that I I'd played with in that summer hockey league were trying out too. So I knew some of them and uh, the tryouts went for a, a little over a week out there in Minneapolis. And then uh, basically what they, the team did, they took some guys from that were trying out there and we started traveling. We started traveling around the United States. We traveled uh, up into Canada. We we're flying to various places. And every day there were guys coming in and coming out. And every day you were wondering if, if that was the day you were going to be sent, you know, with your walking papers to, to go back home. And as it was, I was with the team from September and then into October and then November and the December, never knowing from one day to the next what was going to happen with me. But I was still on the team. Goalies were coming in and out, coming in and out. Other players were coming in and out. We were playing Division I hockey teams. We were playing uh, uh, pro teams, but they were minor league teams from the Central Hockey League, from the American Hockey League, and so on. And I can remember this so clearly. It was in December, right at the end of December. We were going to be playing uh, Dartmouth College. And uh, we had just practiced that morning. And, and then after practice, I would stay out on the ice and take extra shots and try to do everything. Uh, to make the coaches see me and so on, even though it's still three or four months after I've been on the team. And uh, coach calls me into his room and man, I just thought I was gone. I really did. He said, Pete, if you can do what I ask you to do, we want you to go to Japan with us. He said, 
we have another goaltender who's going to be coming in probably in a couple of days. And this was the end of December. His name is Mike Curran. He played with the U.S. national team. He had been, an, I think, an All-American at the University of North Dakota and so on. He was a few years older than I was. And he said, if you can do what I ask you to do, we want you to be on the team. He said, this guy's going to be the starter. We want you to be the backup. And he says, you've got to be ready at all times. If this guy gets hurt or something happens, you've got to be ready to go. He said, you, can you accept that? And I didn't have to think a second, you know. And I get very emotional talking about it now. That's how much it meant to me. Right. And uh, I said, absolutely. And from that point on, I was on the team. I knew I was on the team. I called up my wife to talk to her. We're both crying like, like I am right now, basically. And uh, so we knew that, that the, all the sacrifices we had made were now starting to come true. So basically, that was my story of, of getting there. Wow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm imagining so most of our listeners on this podcast are kids, right, in their car with their parents. And I could just imagine, like, this isn't happening over text messaging instantly, yeah. right? This is like a letter, like an actual handwritten right. letter. Like a, no cell <laughs> sent, phones, no email, off. no All texting, right. right? I'm just imagining, yeah. I'm just imagining the, 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 the weight, right? And just the uncertainty of like, okay, it's, it's like, it's almost like kids now. If they don't get it, like, if somebody doesn't see it's got delivered and somebody answered the text within 18 <laughs> seconds, it was like a failure, right? So I'm just imagining, you know, like that letter goes out, you go about your business, you're like, okay, I'm going to keep working hard and hopefully I hear something. So it's a really an amazing story of perseverance and, and I, I guess trust. Right. And the fact that, you know, you're able to be in a situation where like, listen, I think I'm good enough. I, I, I want to compete at this level. Uh, I'm, I'm giving up an opportunity to do one thing for another. I mean, our, you know, you see kids experience this all the time. Right. Um, you know, and you just, you just hope your gut tells you you're going to the right place, but it's a, that's a unbelievable story. And I think um, you're just hearing, you know, just your emotion in it too, just, you know, just shows how important it was to you. But obviously you put the work in during that whole time, you know, you didn't say like, Oh, you know, I didn't get a call. So giving up. Yeah, it was, uh, I have a lot of people ask me, you know, it must've been a, a thrill, you know, you know, being with the team and so on. It was a thrill, but it was so pressure packed. I was not able to enjoy it, you know, because the, uh, every day I didn't know if I was going to be gone. Right. And right up until the end of December, when uh, Coach Williamson called me in there, and I thought that was the day I was going to be gone. But it, uh, luckily, uh, it was the day that he told me that uh, basically my dream was coming true. Peter, I want to ask this too, uh, and I do want to get into the games, but um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this. I, I've had the real honor of interviewing a lot of veterans, war veterans, uh, military veterans. Um, a lot of the language you're using right now is similar to the language they use when they talk about being in the service. Now, I'm not comparing war to hockey in the sense of the severity of it, but I would, if you're comfortable, love to discuss what being in the military taught you, what being in combat taught you, and how you applied that to hockey. Um, and then also, th th for those of you listening, there was so much pride on his face when he was telling this story. Right. And I, I think that is something we are losing daily in this country just to feel proud to be an American. Right. With all of its joys and faults. Right. Just to be proud to say that we're from here to lead from the front. Um, however, anybody feels about that. Right. So, yeah, I'd love to hear about how your experience in the military um, and in combat affected your hockey career or, or helped you in your hockey career. Yeah, I, I very seldom talk about my military experience in Vietnam. Uh -huh. I, I hesitate to go into a lot of details, but uh, being in the service, uh, what you do learn, I think basically is, is teamwork. Uh, you have to work together to accomplish a goal. You know, there's always goals that you're trying to accomplish and uh, you have to stick together whether things are going well or whether things are not going well. And I, I think those are probably the, things that I learned from being in the service. Uh, I learned what hard work was all about. I always thought I was a hard worker, but I found out I, I was not nearly as hard a worker as I could be when I, when I got in the service. Uh, they pushed you. You go beyond uh, what you thought you could do. Uh, what they did is they took me out of what we, we call your comfort level. And uh, you go way beyond what you ever thought you could accomplish. 
Uh, when you get into situations, whether which are life and death situations, that's when you really find out what you're all about. I saw some big, strong guys who were big talkers when you got into actual uh, life and death situations that were not able to come through. I saw some guys that were meek and mild, that never said anything, that you thought were you know, maybe almost like geek, times, geek times, uh, kinds of people. They were guys you could depend on. So you can't judge a person uh, by what, how they talk or what they say. You have to see what actually happens when something starts and how they react to it. And uh, I, I, I carried a lot of that over into my, into my coaching and into my playing. Uh, I found out what I was capable of doing and I, I kept pushing myself beyond what I would call my comfort level. Uh, when I started coaching kids, I tried to bring some of those aspects into it. Uh, we set goals. Uh, we tried to uh, uh, take steps to reach those goals. It's one side to say, well, we would like to win a championship or we would like to win this game. It's another thing uh, in practice, doing all the things it's going to take to be able to do that. And uh, so I think the military helped me being on the Olympic team. Uh, we, uh, if you watch the 1980 movie with Herb Brooks uh, and, and saw a lot of the conditioning things that they went through, we went through those same things. Uh, uh, our coach had gone to Russia. He had talked to uh, Tarasov, who was their coach. He learned what their training techniques were. He took those techniques and he applied them to us. What Herb Brooks was doing, he was taking those same kind of techniques and applying it to that 1980 team. I saw so much of that when I watched the movie and watched Herb Brooks, uh, uh, some of the sayings that he used and, and some of the techniques that he used with the players. Uh, when you get with younger kids, uh, you can use some of those things within reason. Uh, and because they're younger kids, you have to be careful of how you approach things and some of the things you say. But uh, again, you're, you're trying to get them out of their comfort zones and try to make them realize they can do more than they ever thought they could. Yeah, I was going to say, Bill, you know, like playing playing for Pete and, and being in that Lake Placid environment, like I, I, I'm, you know, I know like the Keith Clarks and the, you know, Chad Cassidy is the world and the guys up in, in Placid now that, you know, you can hear like their own, um, you know, when they're talking about Lake Placid, you could hear a lot of, uh, you know, they love that town and they, and they love that, that, you know, growing up in that environment. So I just, you know, wondering from you, I mean, did you feel that as a student, and as you know, obviously as a player, that there was not, I don't want to say it's extra, extra uh, pressure, but there was that, that feeling like, Hey, you know, I'm, I, we're in, like, we're in a place of greatness and it's going to help us elevate, you know, what we do and, and our game. And obviously having guys like Pete as a mentor, you know, in that situation, I mean, is that, is that prevalent throughout that, that, you know, in your gr in growing up in your youth hockey kind of environment? Absolutely. Um, is it Bantam? Uh, we played on the 80 rink one month after the Olympics. Wow. Yeah. We, <laughs> a month before we all watched that unfold. And the next month we're playing there. Wow. So Lake Placid used to have uh, the international tournament. Um, and the first year that I went uh, as a squirt was 1976. So they were starting to build these facilities for the Olympics. And that was very exciting, you know, in itself. And I still have some of the, mementos that I bought in, in the stores, uh, you know, from that time period, but yeah, every coach, uh, I'm very thankful in, in Oswego, um, you went to Lake Placid every year and it was the best, um, trip of the year. And then after, um, you know, my relationship with Pete started, um, yeah, it did become more special, but just to go back to something you said about being careful, um, with the, with the training, I don't remember that. <laughs> uh, at all um it was called one of the things that the russians taught uh that now pete is is putting kids in a swig of new york into is called fartlek training right interval training get your heart rate way up high and you know rest you know to to mimic you know a game and he did teach uh all of us uh the same experience i had i had no idea what the limits of my body were as a 12, 13 year old kid. So before I ever played for him, we're going to these summer workouts and 
and my I'd come home and my mother looked at me like I was a victim of child abuse. Um, <laughs> you know, your ass would just be dragging. Um, but once you, like Pete said, once you you have that epiphany moment that you know your body doesn't have limits and you can push yourself farther than you ever thought you could. Um, you know, that's just an incredible gift to to give the kids and applicable well beyond the realm of athletics. Yeah, it was different, right, Bill? I mean, I, I taught, you know, I do a lot of stuff on social media now and I got a lot of players that played for me that see my little uh, blurbs on Facebook or Twitter or something like, who the heck are you? Like, that wasn't you. Like, you never did that. Like, how, how <laughs> can you say that? But it is, it's changed, right? And we, and I think just knowing that and knowing your, you know, where you where your limitations as a coach can be about how far and how hard you push kids. And then obviously guys like Pete and yourself know are, 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 you know, are able to see and say, okay, here's where, here's where the threshold is with this group of kids or this particular athlete. So I think that, and that comes right with a lot of just, uh, you know, just your own experiences and just knowing like, you know, where can I push these players? And then, you know, where do they want me to push them? And I think that's, um, you know, it's a great point for young coaches, you know, just to, you can't just institute, you know, something you saw in Europe or something you saw from a, a, you know, a coach, you're like, Oh, that guy's crazy. But, you know, they, they know within, you know, their own world, what the limitations are and what they can and cannot do. I was, I was very fortunate to have Bill and the group of kids that he grew up with as my, my first teams that I was coaching in Oswego, because they just like Bill, they all wanted to, uh, I, I think be winners and they all wanted to uh, do everything they could to try to improve themselves. And uh, so whatever I tried to do with them, they, I, they actually wanted more and more. And I could see that. And I, that's, that's why I would push them to certain limits. And uh, I, it was uh, just a, I had some great moments, uh, you know, coming up through hockey, but I'd still have to say that some of the best moments I've ever had with hockey was coaching these kids here in Oswego and how they responded to my coaching techniques and how they accepted me as a coach and how their parents accepted me as a coach. And uh, some of the best friends I still have are, are still right here in this community. And this guy sitting here next to me is, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's one of them. He's uh, probably as good a friend as anybody could have. I want to tap into a lot of things that were just said, you know, so, um, Pete, first, I just want to thank you for sharing what you did about uh, your time in the service. I, look, I, I have the uh, privilege to get to coach a lot of teams and in a team building uh, capacity. And I always start by saying the greatest team on the planet is, is the United States military. You know, when, I, when I need advice on how to be a team, I look to the military and I get what I'm looking for. So thank you for, for all you did. You guys are my heroes, the ones that came before, after and everyone in between. Um, the other thing I want to tap on is this. We're talking about pushing people beyond their limits. And this comes down to kind of coaching the kid or the character of a person over just the player. Uh, something I like to say every four years, every four years without fail, a world or Olympic record gets broken every time. And I always say to everyone I coach and I mentor, we do not know as humans what our limits are unless we continue to push them. And I think we're combating this today a bit, especially from a mentor-mentee relationship, a coach-to-player relationship, because there seems to be a lot of, uh, how do I put this right, uh, just casual thinking of, I'm just going to relax and and be fine and never push myself. And it's a really dangerous mentality to me now don't get me wrong everybody listening you should relax every once in a while there's nothing wrong with taking a day off or understanding that but if you truly want to achieve greatness or pursue greatness which is also a, a wonderful opportunity that you have you have to be uncomfortable you have to push your limits and you usually need someone whether it's a parent or a mentor or a coach that's going to allow you to get there so uh, bill i'm going to start with you on this one and, and you can use your experience with pete or you can be general here I want to talk about the importance of a great mentor and being a great mentee, right? Because I, I always say this too, when the student is ready, the teacher will arrive, right? It doesn't go the other way around. So uh, before we dive into the Olympic games, and I actually want to get into the games too, to finish the episode, I want to talk about the importance of a mentor mentee relationship. So, so for the kid or the player or the student, that individual has to be willing to turn over their mind and body to 
the mentor or the coach. Uh, I see a lot less of that in the 21st century, uh, which could be a whole other conversation. Um, but, you know, the best teams, that, teams are going to reach their potential when you have a coach that you don't want to let that individual down. You don't want to disappoint that person. And yes, you have your own innate competitiveness and you want to win, but then there's also that element of, I don't want to let this guy down. Um, so Pete's teams were always, um, you know, the best condition teams by far, because he knew that sometimes a less talented team that was better conditioned could beat a more talented team. And that happened uh, with us a lot. Um, but the, the mentor can have the, the best techniques and uh, nuggets of wisdom to pass along, but the, the mentee has got to be willing to accept and ingrain these things in themselves. Right. But I, I want to jump in here real quick because we have to have a, a quick discussion about this because we get emails on this show all the time of parents trying to gauge whether or not they're in a situation where do I have a bad coaching environment or is this coach doing the right thing? Right. And I think there's, there's one of the, the, I don't want to call it an issue, but one of the things that Mike and I see a lot today is kids going, well, it's too hard here. I'm going to another team. I'm just going to switch clubs because I don't like the way this coach is coaching. And I'd say more often than not, it's not that the coach is bad. It's the coach is pushing you and it's uncomfortable and you're not comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. So we, we have a lot of conversations with people emailing us about, well, I think that person is just trying to push you to be the best version of yourself. Um, and I'm, I'm actually proud of the audience for emailing us those questions because it shows that they're curious and how messed up the landscape has become. But can we talk about that for a quick second that, you know, someone pushing you to be your best is not bad coaching, right? Bad coaching is someone trying to make a player maybe score 50 goals and that's all they're focused on when that's, they're not capable of that, which I've seen as well. You know, I, I don't want to be that guy that, you know, oh, things are no, be that than, guy, be that guy. <laughs> but, you know, kids just, they don't have the same experiences that, that I did playing with the same group of guys for a right. decade, you know, year after year after year. And I, you know, I, I've certainly seen it in my coaching career. It's not always about pushing a kid. Oh, the kid doesn't get uh, named captain. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going to go play someplace else next year. Right. I'm not on the power play. I'm going to go play someplace else next year. Uh, I don't like my line mates. I'm going to go play someplace else next year. So, you know, in the area that I grew up in, it was your job to adapt to the coach. <laughs> if you didn't like the coach, you better learn to like him um, or you might not be playing on that team. Um, you know, and Pete had a lot of guys play for him that, um, you know, did turn themselves over to him. And other guys didn't take the conditioning part, you know, so seriously. And, you know, there are guys that got cut because of that. You know, it was his way or no way. And I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. And, you know, it teaches perseverance. You know, once, once you get outside of your youth sports, perseverance is still one of the most valuable skills you can have. And, you know, pushing through something that wasn't ideal for you um, is mm -hmm. a great gift to give to any kid because they're going to need it. Oh, I love that you said it like that. It's a great uh, gift. I love that you said it like that. You know, and, and Pete, um, you know, everybody knew his expectations. And if you were going to play for him, you were going to meet those expectations or you weren't going to play for him. So, um, and he gave all of us, um, you know, uh, that gift. And, you know, that chapter that I wrote in Christie's book, the original thing for her article, when I started writing about my coaches, I wrote about six or eight coaches. And at least all my minor hockey coaches, every single one of them modeled the hatred of losing. And if you're going to avoid this feeling when you lose, well, then you've got to do some things to be better prepared. Mm -hmm. and of course, that all kind of accumulated with Pete with, um, you know, one of his, he's got a lot of famous sayings, but one of them is, you want the same results, keep doing the same thing. You want different results, you better do something different. Whether that means, um, you know, you don't want your shots that very hard, you better do some more wrist curls all mm -hmm. summer long. Right. Um, you know, things like that. So well, it's, and it's in the article, right? By by failing to pre prepare, right? Like yeah, we, we wrote this, right? So I'm very grateful to all my coaches um, uh, for modeling the hatred of, of losing. 
Um, and the group of guys that I came up with that Pete was talking about, um, it doesn't matter whether it's darts or horseshoes. Um, it's not about the enjoying playing, you're, you're playing to win. And that competitiveness, you know, carries over into life. And um, Pete's got a lot of successful former players that were more successful in life than they were on the hockey rink, uh, much in credit to his teachings. Yeah. I mean, I think that you're, I mean, I think there's so much, I mean, in hour three, we can probably go over this, but I think, <laughs> I think it's, uh, but I, I, I think there's, I think there's so much there, right. That, that now the way we have to coach is, you know, the trilogy, right. Of making sure our coach, our parent and our player understand, you know, what our mission is and what our goals are so that we don't have these issues down the road. And we're going to have them. I mean, I think it's just, I think it's just become so easy to get up and leave and to search and look, I mean, when, when we grew up or, you know, in other generations, you know, you didn't have options. So you learn to adapt within, you know, the place you were and, uh, and, and coaches could, could coach a little differently. I could wield a different hammer because, you know, you knew the players didn't have choices. So I think a lot of us are just trying to find that line between, okay, how much can I communicate with parents to help that, you know, to get them to help me connect with their player? And help me connect with their athletes so that they're like, you, you know, Bill, that was a great, uh, you know, uh, term is that they're mirroring, right? We want, we want the mom and dad or whoever's bringing the kids to the rink to mirror the same values that we're asking out of the kid. It can't be, oh, that would happen in the rink, but now our value system is different here at home. And I think we can get that mirroring. Uh, and I love the fact that, you know, like me, I, you know, I play with the same kids for 10 years in a row. Right. And you got to and you got to watch kids that, that progressed and didn't progress. And now, I mean, you're lucky if you have kids play with each other for 10 months in a row. And and it's such a so. But again, we and that's one of the reasons actually we got on these podcasts is because it allowed us to talk to some great people to figure out, OK, well, what what are these are challenges? This is the fact. Right. And how can we how can we adapt to the to the world we're in now, which is not changing? Um, it, it, so it's like, OK, well, how do how do we? communicate with players and parents and and get the best out of our athletes so that's that's you know it's great that you're you know it sounds like to me i mean based off of you know who you are now you're evolving as well you know in, in what you do as a coach right you can't just like well that's the way pete did it in 19 you know 78 and that's the way it's going to be and i think you know we all evolve and then we just try to find the best of the people we've we've evolved with and and hopefully you come out with a, a good product so i think and it sounds like you guys have been doing that you know, and communicating with each other and working through those things. And I think that's where that mentorship piece comes in is that the mentor is not there to just say, Hey, this is how I did it. You do it this way. It's, Hey, this is how I did it. But now you're, this is your challenge. So how are you meeting that challenge and how are you evolving? I, I think that, you know, as, as time goes on, you know, things do change. And uh, the way you look at uh, coaching today is I think definitely different than the way we looked at it, you know, back when I first started in the late 70s, early 80s. So uh, again, uh, I, th I think there's some good things that we can take from the past and keep applying them. And, uh, you know, like setting goals, uh, working hard, uh, coming out of your comfort zone, some of those things. But I think the bottom line is parents want their kids to play. Uh, I think you start running into problems sometimes is when uh, you have uh, teams and you have some kids that are playing a lot more than other kids, or some kids don't get on the ice as much as you would like to see them on, on the ice. If I'm a parent and my kid's not getting on the ice much and we're traveling all over the place, you know, all over the Northeast to, to play games and my kid's not playing as much as other kids, that can start leaving a bad taste in your mouth. So I think uh, one of the things is, if you do, what, what is your philosophy when you get started? I think the parents have to know it. And, uh, and uh, even, even sometimes when they say, okay, I agree with the philosophy, once the season starts and they see their kids not playing as much, that philosophy seems to uh, all of a sudden not mean much. So uh, again, uh, it's important that I think that parents get their kids in a situation where they can play where they can hopefully develop. And then what are, what are those kids' goals? What are, you know, maybe they just want to go out and have fun. Maybe they're not there to you know, have to worry about winning every single game. Uh, uh, in the old days, they had what we call house league. 
and the kids went out and they played. They all played equal time. If they won, fine. If they didn't win, that's okay too. They start getting into road teams. Now winning seems to be a little bit more important. Uh, kids, some kids start playing a little bit more than others. And as you go up the line, uh, that's what happens. Sometimes kids that are really good players at one level, as they go up the line, all of a sudden they become maybe role players. They're not playing as much and it's hard for them to accept. So again, I, I know things do change. If I was uh, coming in as a coach today, I probably would be doing some things differently. But all I know is I did what I knew back then. And uh, uh, I, I tried to get kids to buy into it. And a lot of the kids that I was with here on Oswego did buy into it. And uh, I, I appreciate the effort that they gave me. Well, and I'm going to say this too, Pete. You know, there is one aspect of the game that transcends time. Right now, I think we would all agree that, you know, training today is evolved. It has evolved tremendously. Like you, you have to understand training in the 21st century to be a great hockey player. If you want to do that, other things too, uh, skill sets, right. Tactics, those all evolve the, across the board, all the interviews we've done. The one thing that has never needed to evolve is boy, do I love playing hockey? I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of the interview where you said, yeah, man. And it, yeah, for those of you listening, watch this episode. The smile on your face when you said, we used to play on Mirror Lake and we would just go out there and play and we loved it. If that is removed from the game in any way, we're in deep, deep trouble. Your kid's in trouble, you're in trouble. As a coach, as a parent, it doesn't matter. And I've seen it removed um, by parents, by coaches, even by the kids in some stances because of the anxiety that they feel. If you cannot instill a deep love of the game, and I mean deep, and it, it cannot be enough just for the parents listening. You might have that. <laughs> it doesn't mean your kids automatically have that. Now, many of them do. Don't get me wrong. But if you cannot help to cultivate that love, it doesn't matter what you do. It, it when, won't matter. Uh, yeah. When, when, speaking of playing on natural ice out on Mirror Lake and Lake Placid back in the, back in the 50s, uh, you develop that love of the game. Uh, right. Everybody is out on the ice at the same time. You know, you break up into teams. The teams might be 20 players each, right. you know, but you have that huge surface of ice out there. And you have to learn how to skate to keep up with the older guys. You have right. guys who are 17, 18 years old that are junior and senior in high school. And here you are, 10, 11 years old. So if I want to play in that game, I've got to push myself without even realizing it to try to keep up with those other kids. And you're just loving it. And those older kids, they, they were some of our early mentors. They taught us, you know, how to play the game. Right. They encouraged us. And I, we had fun. I mean, I couldn't wait to get up in the morning. It might be 15 degrees out to go up and skate <laughs> out on that lake to be with those older kids. And that, and that was, so there was nothing better than the memories of doing that when I was a kid. I, I, I still don't think there's anything better. Sorry, Bill, go ahead. <laughs> Let's jump in with the story. So, you know, Pete always, he likes worker bees. And if you're working to develop your game, you know, you were, um, you'd be in his good graces. So when I was a seventh and an eighth grader, uh, school would get out at, when I had Pete, school would get out at like 210, but the high school practice didn't start till maybe 315. And we would bring our skates and sticks to school, run to the rink, which was four blocks away. The guy that ran the rink worked for the TPW uh, a guy named Butch Ponzi just passed away this past year was a fellow softball hall of famer with Pete. Pete played a lot of softball with him. He would, he would let us on the rink. There'd be no, it would be dead time. Mm. And he'd let us out there. Well, now the high school guys are starting to trickle out because it's, you know, it's their practice time. And Pete would, once the whole team got out there, he'd let us stay out there for like the first 15 minutes when they were doing some warm up type of things. And some of those older guys would take us, under their wing or maybe rifle a puck at our ankle. Um, <laughs> but it was, that to us was the coolest thing that we got to be out there on the ice and uh, with the high school kids. But before that, you know, you're, you're working on your game before three on three was a, a thing. Um, you know, that's what we used to do hit the post because um, we couldn't get a goalie out there. So <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, and when that guy, when Butch Ponzi passed away, all of us kids that 
that he allowed to do that. We had a big texting thread going, you know, talking about those memories. And like you said, big smiles on our faces, some of the best times of our life. You know, I, I, it's funny, you're making me think of a story too, that, you know, when I was in high school, especially the younger years, that 15, 16 time period, uh, most kids on Friday nights wanted to go out to the movies, do stuff like that. I, I went to open hockey at my local arena and played with men. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and man, they, they put me on, they taught me a lot. Right. And, and they could see, you know, here's a 16 year old out here that he's not doing what the other kids are doing. Um, and I remember I would, they were so much you know better because they were older. Right. And they taught me so much. And it's funny is I, I can't say the rink because there's too many people in my local area that listen to this, but I remember <laughs> Bill, to your point, uh, my father, who, whom I love very much, um, used to bring, I'll just say this, he used to bring the rink in attendant at night, a, a, a six pack of beverages. And he would let me skate after the last skate till two, three o'clock in the morning sometimes. Mm -hmm. And some of my best memories are just being out there on the ice, thinking how cool is this that I'm out here right now. And my dad, my dad would help him put the chairs up like, you know, I, I obviously as a father now, I appreciate this much, much more than I did then. But, uh, you know, those little moments, right? It's, it's we, we can't remove those from the game either, right? That, you know, it's important to play with other people. It's important to get different perspectives. It's important to play with people that are going to, you know, overpower you in, in the right way, right? And teach you how to how to play these games. Because uh, those are the things I remember, right? It's, it's funny what you remember when you're done, right? You remember the locker room. You remember the people you played with. Uh, it, it, I mean, again, Pete, you might have some other memories too with, with an Olympic uh, silver medal, but really the things that stick with you are the people and the process and, and, and how that works around it's special stuff. Yeah. I, our, our Olympic team, uh, we have reunions. I don't know how many teams do this on a regular basis, but every three or four years we get together somewhere it might be down in Florida, might be out in Minnesota or whatever. But, uh, and, and one of the things we do when we get together is we have a meal together one of the nights and everybody has to get up and tell what the experience meant to them. Mm. And every single guy on that, on that team that gets up starts crying, you know, so it's, uh, yeah. and it shows how much uh, the experience meant to us. And they, they also talk a little bit about, you know, how they got to be where they are, you know, uh, all the hockey experiences they had coming up through. So uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of great memories. And at my age, you start appreciating it, you know, appreciating them even more. Have you guys read the, the book, Striking Silver? No, but I'm going to have to now. <laughs> so written by my, you know, guys I grew up across the street from, Tom and Jerry Caracoli, um, interviewed every member of this team and wrote a book called Striking Silver, the, the forgotten team, which the 72 team was. And um, I don't want to give it away to you, but you know, there's a couple of guys that Pete talked about the Vietnam experience. There's a couple of guys that were pulled out of Vietnam in combat wow. to try out for the team. And if they got cut, they had to go back to Vietnam. Yeah. If they made the team, oh my God. The, the government's going to give them an exemption. How'd you like to go into a battle drill in a corner with a guy <laughs> that if he gets cut is going back to Vietnam? Can you right. imagine? No, I can't. I'm going to be really blunt with you. I, we grew up in an era where if you get cut, you go back to Nintendo. Yeah. yeah. That's, so, that's insane to me. Perspective uh, right there. But, uh, yeah. For your listeners out there, it's called uh, Striking Silver. I, I just looked it up on Amazon and I did yeah. see it. And I'm going to be purchasing that immediately after we, we conclude here today. Um, Look, the audience is going to get on me if I don't ask you about the 72 games, Pete. So we do have to walk through the games. You know, I was just looking here um, just to paint the picture here, right? So you're in Japan. You're playing the Soviet Union at the peak of their power. It's right in the middle of their run, all right? Um, Czechoslovakia is another powerful team. I think it's also important to, to remind people the Olympics probably worked a little differently back then uh, than they do today. There's no uh, gold medal game per se, right? It's, it's all about ranking at that time. Um, right. in the combined record. So why don't you walk us through 1972 going up against Tretiak? And I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of names on there from the 80 team, if you know what I'm trying to say. And yet a Mark, young Mark Howe on your team, I believe. Absolutely. Um, right. Yeah. To walk us through yeah. the Olympics. Okay. The Olympics were, they were a, a round robin kind of situation, uh, but you still had to play a, a game to even get into the medal round. So we played Switzerland 
And we were behind, I think we were behind early in that game and we came back and won that game. And that, that put us into the medal round. And then you end up uh, playing a round robin against uh, teams like uh, Czechoslovakia, Finland, Sweden, Russia, uh, I think, uh, who else? Poland, I think, had a team. Uh, the Canadians were playing in that Olympics, okay? Because they were protesting that they couldn't use their professional players because mm. they said that Russia was using all professional players, Right. okay? That was a whole different era back then. It was during the Cold War. You had, uh, you know, Russia versus uh, uh, the United States or Russia versus uh, democratic countries and so on. Uh, but all we wanted to do was play hockey, okay? If the Canadians didn't go, we're going to try to do the best we could. In the years earlier, we had not done very well in either uh, U.S. national play or in the Olympics uh, after 1960, which they won the gold. We hadn't really done well. So we were picked, I think, to finish fifth or sixth, fifth, I think, in the Olympics, which is just about last. And so we go in there, uh, you know, we had a bunch of young guys. Uh, we, we felt that we were pretty good, but yet most of us, uh, or a lot of us hadn't had a lot of international experience. So we didn't really know what to expect from some of the teams. Before the Olympics, we did play the Russians a few times and they kicked our butts. Uh, we played them in New York City and Madison Square Garden. We played them in Philadelphia. We played them in St. Louis. We played them in Minneapolis. And we had played the Czechs also over here in America. They had come over to get some uh, games in before the Olympics. And so, you know, I played on the ice against the Russians. I played against Trecek. I played against the Czechs and so on. Uh, most of those games, uh, they had beaten us by, I would say, at least eight or nine goals. Uh, my proudest moment was I played against the Russians in St. Louis. Uh, and uh, I went in halfway through the game coaches splitting goalies and you had to be able to accept that whether you liked it or not and uh, we were behind I think six nothing going in the, when I went in halfway through the game at the end of the game I think the score was uh seven one so I played a happy game I gave up one goal wow. against the Russians that was the same team that the uh, NHL all-star team played against the Russians right after the Olympics in 1972. That right. was the same team. And so I, that was, I was really proud of how I played in that game. And I think I showed my coach that if I had to play, you know, I could play. Uh, but we didn't have a lot of success against the Russians here in the U.S. We played against them four or five times and they really beat us bad. But uh, as the Olympics got started, uh, we, we uh, let's see, we beat uh, Poland. We beat the Czechs. We lost to Sweden. Sweden had a great team, great players. Uh, we beat Finland and we lost to Russia. Russia beat us, I think, 7-3 in the Olympics. That was the best score we had played against them. And uh, the Russians had to beat uh, let's see, when it came down to it, we played the Czechs. When we beat the Czechs, the Russians knew they had the gold. So that was a big game for us, beating the Czechs. It was a big game for the Russians because the Russians always had a tough time with the Czechs. And uh, when when we beat them that uh, night, they had, their coach came to our coach and they, they invited us over to their dorms. Their dorms were in a totally different place in the Olympic Village because they were communists. There was a Cold War. They did not allow their team to associate with anybody else. But they snuck us into their dorm. And the, and the uh, vodka was flowing and everything was going. You got to meet all of their guys. You got to shake hands with them. Uh, I met Trechak. He gave me a little, uh, it was like a postcard with the Russian team on it. And he signed the back of it. And I've, I've still got that. Awesome. Uh, so that was that was special for me. But uh, they were thanking us for beating the Czech team, which gave them the gold medal. And as it was, uh, everybody ended up beating everybody else, except the Russians beat everybody. But, you know, we beat we beat the Czechs, but we lost to the Swedes. The Swedes, I think, lost. I don't know if they lost to Finland or lost to the Czechs. I can't remember now. But everybody beat it, beat, was beating everybody else, except the Russians beat everybody 
and that ended up giving us the silver medal. And uh, uh, so that was really a tremendous thrill for us uh, to be able to win a medal when we were not favored to even, you know, finish in the top four or five. And uh, so it was a great experience. Uh, uh, there's about a three or four days left in the Olympics after our last game. So we got a chance to really uh, enjoy ourselves after that. Uh, we went to all the other Olympic events and, and so on. And uh, uh, the, the thrill that all of us on the team had uh, is carried over to this day because I said we have uh, our reunions all the time and we talk about what the games meant to us as individuals and uh, how it changed our lives probably forever. Uh, a lot of the things that have happened to me in my life have happened because of my Olympic experience. And uh, so it was uh, something that uh, I'll, I'll take with me all the way to my grave. So it's just a, a great experience. You know, I love that you shared all that. I also love hearing these stories because I'm always um, amazed at hearing the part about, well, they invited us over and we had drinks together, you know, and, and Mike and I had the privilege of interviewing Lou Vero a few years back. And he talked about his relationship with Anatoly Tarasov and how they were really friends. And that in spite of the Cold War, uh, hockey kind of prevailed over the, the international hatred, right? Um, in the sense that, you know, people, I, I always find that amazing that at the peak of the Cold War, the hockey players found a way to hang out with each other and, and learn from each other, right? It just It shows you the power of, of human spirit when you really think about it. Well, I, I think hockey players and the hockey community have always, uh, you know, been a tight knit group and it, it didn't make any difference whether you were playing the Russians or whoever it was. Uh, hockey coaches are always willing to share ideas. They're always willing to share everything. I worked at summer hockey schools for many years and in one of the best parts of the school, we enjoyed working with the kids on the ice, but at night we would sit down over a few beers and there was college coaches there. There were professional coaches there at the hockey schools and we would talk hockey. And I would be sitting there with my notebook and I'd be writing like crazy, you know, taking note down, you know, well, what do you do on, uh, when the other team has this power play? How do you, how do you try to kill it off? Uh, what do you do in this situation? All the different situations, what kind of drills do you use, you know, for various things? And I, I would come out of every summer at hockey school, I'd come out of there with notebooks of notes and information that I tried to use on my kids back home if it was appropriate. And uh, I think that's the way hockey is all over the world. Our, our coach, Murray Williamson with the Olympic team was very good friends with Tarasov. And I, I know there was other people in the Western world that were good friends with him. And, and uh, I think many of the hockey techniques that we still even use today were picked up from a lot of the Russian ways that they did their things. They right. actually did more work off ice than they did on ice. Uh, whether it was stick handling drills, shooting drills, whatever, they did more work off ice than they did on ice. Tell them, tell them the story about the going to practice with the bags in the back of the truck and they'd run in their equipment. Oh, well, again, uh, they their techniques, like I said, off ice were more uh, extensive than on ice. And uh, they, what Billy was talking about was how they used to push themselves uh, and they worked year round. They would put things in the back of uh, trucks. They would have to push the vehicles around. That was for leg strength and so on. But uh, again, after the 72 Olympics, when the Russians came over to uh, North America to play the NHL all-star team, uh, they they found out how good the Russians really really were. Right. And uh, I don't know if you remember the last game. I think Paul Henderson scored the goal to win it, so the NHL ended up winning the series. But uh, the Russians had beaten those all uh, the NHL All Stars three or four games. And uh, they now everybody wanted to find out well what kind of techniques did the Russians use? What were they doing in their practices to, to get as good as they are? And uh, then I used, then I would see uh, my my Olympic team in 1972 was using those Russian ideas. And even today, if you go out on the ice, there's all so many things going on that I said, oh, 
those were things that the Russians were using way back in 1972. Right. You know, it's funny. And you're just supposed to Sorokin uh, pu pu pushing a truck, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, <by himself. laughs> no, hasn't gotten yeah. hasn't gotten too far. But, <laughs> Mike, I'll tell you this too. You know, it's funny is we talked about history earlier, right? And that you, if you read history, you know history. You can evolve and learn. And uh, you know, the Russians played in five man units, and we're starting to see that in the game again. We're starting to see yeah. that that you know there really are no positions sometimes in the offensive zone, and and it's oh. uh, it's amazing to see how the game kind of reinvents itself over and over again. But to your to your point, Pete, you know it's the ability to to learn from each other, not hold things back, to have an open environment of education and understanding and learning. And you know when it comes to to Anatoly Tarasov, and I, I've studied the man. You know everything I've read says he was just a good human being in a in a in a different country in a different world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's amazing what he was able to accomplish. So I'm looking at the time here, and I, I do I have one final question, Mike. I don't know if you have anything you want to ask too before I before I jump into this. You do? Is that is that a nod or? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I, I really well, I got to answer because I know Jamie Prince is going to get on me uh, with Coach Digby and uh, and uh, everybody up there in Swigo. But so so is Cam's the best pizza in the Swigo? Is that is that, <laughs> is that hands down? Or you guys can't answer that question? It's live and recorded, guys. Let's do it. <laughs> we can cut it. We can cut it out. But. <laughs> my my golf league my golf league partner I got to tee off at four o'clock today is is Nick Canale senior. Nick oh yeah, Canale. Okay, so we we could go with Canale's that, restaurant. I, so I I got to go with Canale's pizza. Okay, smart, got it. Smart play, <laughs> safe play, <no>, smart play. <laughs> I, uh, you guys are, you guys are great. I really appreciate this. Everybody, but there's a lot of good pizza places here. I know that. No doubt, no pizza doubt. in New York. Yeah, but so you guys, here's my final question, and and this one's really for the kids listening, right? Maybe the young parents listening. And parents, if your kids are listening, you know, bring them a little closer to the to the speaker, or make sure they're looking up. Uh, it's a question for both of you, right? You know, as teachers, as educators, as hockey players, right? If you had to leave one parting message with today's children about the journey in the game, what would that statement of impact be? And Bill, I'll start with you. Saving the toughest question for last. Um, you know, at the end, when your playing career is, is over, um, which, you know, um, as far as college, because then there's always the glory of men's league. But, you know, you want to look back and say, did I put everything that I could into it? Did I leave anything, you know, on the table? Could I have been a better player? And, you know, you sleep better at night when the answer to that question is, is no, I, I, I did everything um, you know, I could do, and I can only, you know, that's my answer to the question, uh, you know, because of Pete, um, he taught me to, uh, to push myself and how to better myself, uh, not accept mediocrity. Um, so, you know, when my college days were done, uh, I could say, yeah, I, I was the best player I could be. Um, and then the fact that, you know, you find out that all these lessons are applicable and more applicable in your, uh, in, in non-hockey life than they are in the rink. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty gratifying experience. So um, my message to a kid would be, you know, you got to work absolutely as hard as you can work. Uh, so you can have a little peace of mind down the road. Uh, I, th I think that uh, athletics and school are very similar. Uh, I think that, you know, it, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. Uh, I think you want to have fun doing it. So it's always fun if you have uh, coaches and teachers that uh, try to try to make what you're doing, you know, fun at the same time as you're working hard. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, as, as a kid, I think you have to ask yourself, you know, what do, what do I want to get out of uh, athletics or what do I want to get out of hockey? And, uh, you know, if, if you want to uh, set goals, uh, to be make the high school team or make a junior team or make a college team, then you're going to have to work harder. That's just, that's the way life is. Uh, if you just want to go out and have fun. Okay. That's okay. There's, there's teams I think that, that do that. So try to put yourself in the right situation. That's going to allow you to have fun, what you're doing. And that sometimes as you're, as you're doing that, you, if you don't want to, if you don't have, you know, really high goals, maybe as you're going along, you find, Hey, I'm starting to get better at this. I'm starting to improve at it. Now, maybe I'm going to set some different goals and uh, maybe you'll shoot a little bit higher. But I think, I think the important thing is you've got to enjoy what you're doing. 
and you've got to try to put yourself in a situation that's going to be enjoyable. And, I, and the same with the parents. Try to get your kids into a situation that's going to be enjoyable for them. And you've got to remember, it's for them, not, not so much for you as a parent. I think a lot of parents look at their kids as their entertainment. And uh, instead of just having their kids go out and enjoy what they're doing, whether they're winning or losing, or whether it's a road team, or whether it's not a road team, or whatever. But uh, I, I think that's where I would leave it. I, I know I, as I've gotten older, I've mellowed a little bit uh, in my outlook toward athletics. And, uh, but, but I still know that if you want to reach certain levels, that uh, it's going to require a certain amount of effort to be able to get there. So uh, I think I'll just leave it at that and uh, just have parents try to get their kids in a situation that's going to be fun for them. Okay. That's a fantastic answer, Pete. And guys, this has been an awesome interview. I appreciate all the stories. I appreciate all the history. I appreciate all the sentiments. For two, for two quick things. Please. Yeah, please. Um, well, well, three. I was happy to be there for Pete's non-mellow years, <laughs> um, which were vastly different from his current mellow years. Um, the original thing that I wrote for Christy about coaches, I wrote about six or seven of them. And another guy that I wrote about um, his name is Danny Ford, and he was my Bantam coach uh, for two years. So and you could argue the most formative of the years of a, somebody's life, age 13 to 18, I had Danny Ford for two years and Pete Sears for three years. Um, any success that I've had in my life is directly attributed to the influence of those two guys over that five-year period. Wow. And uh, I have the same type of relationship with, with Danny Ford today that I do with with Pete. Um, they're two of my best friends and guys that I still call up for guidance and, um, you know, everything, everything great that's happened to me, everything horrible that's ever happened to me. Those two guys are constants, uh, in my life. Uh, lastly, I got to give a shout out to my daughter, Monica, um, after, uh, being on the Cortland state women's team for four years. Um, a few weeks back, she was named, uh, assistant women's coach at Morrisville college. That's awesome. So, uh, so she's starting a coaching career um, just in the last couple of weeks here. Awesome. If I can, I'd just like to mention, Bill mentioned Dan Ford. Uh, Dan, uh, uh, I think he and I have a very similar outlook on coaching and working with kids. A lot of the success I had with my high school teams here, I can attribute to some of the things that Dan did before. Just like Billy said, he played for Dan for two years and then I had Bill and a lot of the kids that Dan had coached earlier. So uh, I, I would like to give Dan a lot of credit for that. So if Dan is out there, if he's listening, I'd like to thank you, Dan. So uh, Pete, I got to ask you this now, are you like a, a grandparent mentor to Bill's daughter? Is that, is that, is that the transcending down through, <laughs> through the, the, it hasn't, well, she, I mean, she only got hired two weeks ago. I'm um, tough teasing, obviously. Yeah. That's, that's uh, but, but she has been uh, uh, on the phone with uh, Danny Ford. There you um, go. Because when he was coaching at Oswego State, one of his primary jobs was recruiting. Um, and, and that's my daughter's, one of her responsibilities is recruiting. So they've already had some conversations about the ins and outs of uh, recruiting kids for their program. That's amazing. Look, rounding the episode out, when we started out this way too, the importance of mentorship, being a good mentee and yeah. really sending the elevator back down once you get to the top is so important for not just yourself but the game right is our ability to pass down the knowledge and the mentorship and it transcends hockey these are life lessons these are things that make you a better human being and um that is really when i think about the hockey community and, and this this could be true of a lot of communities but when i uh, think about the hockey community the one i live in that's the greatest gift that it provides is is the mentorship the the how to be a good person the how to strategize your day or on the ice uh, and I think that all of us in that in that guild are blessed. So uh, I want to thank you both for coming on today. I want to remind the audience, get USA Hockey Magazine. It's in this month's edition in July. Uh, the article is in there uh, uh, going over a lot of the stuff we went over today. Uh, make sure you look for that book, Striking Silver, if you want to hear more about <clears throat> uh, Pete's adventures over in Japan. And uh, Bill, Pete, fantastic episode. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having us, guys. No, thank you. And that's going to do it for this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Remember, all of the episodes are on ourkidsplayhockey.com. Uh, make sure if you love this show, go give it a five-star review on uh, Apple or wherever you listen. And uh, above all, thank you 
all for taking the time today. Everybody have a great week. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.